Okay, all yours, Richard. Oh, <laughs> we're having uh, improvisation here. <clears throat> yeah, thank you for coming. My name is Richard Anderson. 1994, uh, Guy Van Cleve and I started the Science Colloquium. That's what this is. And for 20 years, every week we had, had a science program for the Science Colloquium. We called it I'm sorry, we called it the kickback science seminar in those days. And then we had COVID. And of course, that kicked everything in the head. And we're recovering from that. So I appreciate you coming, especially our speaker. And I'm just wondering if some of you can tell me, why did you come? Were you sent for extra credit or what? Anyone volunteering? Well, I'm glad you're here anyway. Okay, so <clears throat> in 1849, the gold miners had a lot of trouble with malaria. It had been introduced from uh, the European continent for for uh, health seeking, and here it was, and we had malaria here. So keep that in mind. We have perfect conditions for growing <clears throat> malaria organisms. Fortunately, we don't have malaria organisms. He'll talk about that. But by 1919, it was such a problem, they decided to make mosquito control districts throughout California. And that's why I have the pleasure of introducing our speaker today. Uh, Dr. Wakoli Wakesa is from Nigeria, and he has already been the director of uh, three, two, two other mosquito districts. And he's been here now four years, I think. Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> he started his education in Nairobi, University of Nairobi uh, for, uh, I guess, uh, BS and MS, and then came to UC Davis for his medical entomology uh, degree doctorate. And so, he has been taking care of us, and I thank you, and I'd like you to welcome Dr. Wakesa Wakoli. Wakoli Wakesa, sorry. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. It works. Okay, cool. Thank you very much for welcoming me here. I hope that is good. As you heard, my name is Wakoli Wekesa. I really don't mind my name being butchered here and there because that's what it is. <laughs> it's a little difficult to pronounce. Um, and I'm looking around as if, man, I'm not that popular, or mosquitoes are not that popular, but I know it's winter time. If you talk about mosquitoes in winter time, eh, not a whole lot of people pay attention. But if it was August, I think this place will be full. And I brought my, my colleagues here. I told them if the tomatoes are thrown away, I'll duck and it'll hit you. <laughs> I have my colleagues here, the lead staff at uh, Eastside, Jason Boring and Tom North. They work with me over there. They take a few punches here and there for all of us. Uh, my talk. I didn't know whether the audience a little bit, and uh, I'm glad I'm invited here. So I prepared a talk as if it's a lecture, Good. and that's what it's going to be. So you're going to bear with me. It's a lot of detail, but the details that are fun, because we can take them home and use them, at least chalk your memory or use them for tomorrow, because mosquitoes are going to be here. The weather is changing, and they'll be here any time now. Now, when I saw the the invitation, I looked at it and said, man, that reminds me of home. I was born and raised in Kenya, and those baobab trees are mainstay if you're driving to, let's see. Oh, no, you can see the arrow on the, on the... Just the arrow on the... Yeah, on the... Okay. Oh. 
if you're driving from Nairobi to Mombasa, uh, the bo uh, baobab trees are the mainstay out there. And last March, I was all heading, actually heading to see my brother in Mombasa, and that's one tree over there. But it's not as clean as the one that was on the on the flyer there. It has a, quite a lot of scars on the side because people use the, the bark for medicine. So it's gotten a few wounds there over the years for folks looking for medicine of the tree. As you heard, my name is Okolo Ekesa. Been manager Eastside since uh, June of 2019. Uh, it's almost four years now, and I love it here because it reminds me of home. I deal with the country rural situation every day. It's just fun to be here. And this year, I'm actually also the president of uh, Mosquito Control Association of California 2023. So. As I said, I didn't know the audience well, but I thought I'll break my talk into parts that I can digest and help the audience also digest um, a little bit. So it's a more of a lecture, but also things to take home for uh, as we walk through the history and what we do as an association for the state and as a district here. Uh, you guys don't know, but East Side is a memorable very well established uh, district since uh, from the beginning. One time we were the center of musical control literally in the world, 1949, literally. The whole world came here to see what Eastside and the state of California does in mosquito control. So I'll walk you through it. So I have four parts for my talk, actually five. Uh, history of mosquito control in the state and that of Stanislaus County mosquitoes of the Central Valley and our county, the surveillance methods and potential diseases they may transmit, mosquito management and control. And then at the end, I'll talk about the new arrival in our neighborhood the last two, three years. We call them exotic mosquitoes, but in general, call them invasive aedes. One has made it here, there are two others on the way. They could get here any time. It's always good to know, or at least to be in the know. Uh, and thank you, uh, Richard, as mentioned, during the gold rush in 19, uh, 1840s, 49, 50, malaria came with folks who showed up in the state. In the foothills, we got malaria, a place called Penryn. Penryn uh, in Auburn, as you go to Auburn, that was a settlement of most immigrants that were coming to perfect, uh for gold and malaria settled in. A lot of Brits, folks from England, from around the world, they came out there. Malaria became a prevalent disease. But by then, nobody knew that malaria was a serial mosquitoes. So they never worried about the mosquitoes in the area being the source of the transmission. This information came about in, 19, you wouldn't believe, 1898. Sir Charles Manson, working in uh, Southeast Asia, observing through microscope, so filaria worm in a mosquito cell gland, 1898. 1901, a French scientist working in uh, today Algeria found literally what looks like malaria parasite in the salivary gland mosquitoes. And by 1903, of course, in the news around the world is a, oh, the association of mosquitoes and malaria. What it is, malaria was, was generally considered bad air, actually in, in Italian, it was bad air associated malaria with the season. When it gets cold and wet, people get sick from this ailment, they could die from it. And then malaria, of course, the Paris was known from there. 1903, the precursor was controlled in the state of California, other than the disease, and of course, knowing the mosquitoes in the valley were words of them, didn't know what to do about it. A group of folks in Marine, uh, Marine San Rafael, which were actually an improvement club, they came together, wanted to improve the neighborhood. They could not manage mosquitoes, and they thought, we'll look for a professor to help me consider that. Professor Wickerworth at UC Berkeley was commissioned, was actually given a small grant to find ways to reduce mosquitoes in the, for them at, uh, in San Rafael. 
and he managed. I got a bunch of students. They went and drained essentially the marshes nearby. Voila, the season, the summer was a lot more palatable. And they thought if we reduce this, the outcome will be that. Uh, similar improvement uh, clubs in San Mateo, in Alameda, actually had money for the following year to ask for the same. The same professor went out in the summer with his students, summer students, and did the same. Following year, he said, I'll get better. He hired a student, actually gave him a job, Quail, who became a famous man, um, to help him in 1906. And then that 1906, we had an earthquake in San Francisco, messed up the whole neighborhood, but the seed for mosquito control was already planted. 1908, a professor was hired out of New Jersey. His name is William Hans by UC Berkeley, this time for just mosquito work. He was a malaria uh, specialist. Then when he came here, he found actually the biggest problem people had other than malaria in the foothills was just a nuisance, the bites of mosquitoes, just heart of mosquitoes, many of them. And he turned to focus on that, tried to pass a mosquito control law. It took a while for him working with a politician, you won't believe the, 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 the owner of the Italian bank, which became Bank of America, was at the center of that. Him and one of the real estate developer with the Professor Hams literally convinced the politician. And in 1915, uh, Governor Hiram Johnson signed the law, mosquito abatement law, into uh, uh, onto the books. And that's where mosquito abatement districts were created, 1915. A few years later, we went to Second War, uh, First World War, and things slowed down a little bit, but most of Mosquito people went into the war. By the time they came back, they had a few more knowledge and impact on what we have today as Mosquito Control. That law, Mosquito Amendment Law, created essentially three things. Authority for the formation of districts, how to form them. The cities can come together, county and folks form one, provided governance structure and funding of those districts. Funding comes from property assessments, from um, uh, the area being served, or in addition, benefit assessment. Each property assessed a penny or two or whatever to, to put money together for that purpose. Some areas with the state were focused then on disease. As I mentioned, malaria was the main thing, and a few diseases were discovered later. But other areas still insisted on actually controlling the nuisance, nuisance mosquito issue. Those who insisted on controlling nuisance really didn't like these big acts for disease. And they opted uh, to follow the law that was being used in weed control and others, which was a pest abatement law. When we came into being that east side in 1939 to form a district, our district went through that law and left a mosquito abatement law that had been passed in 1915. 1930, there was a mysterious disease that actually in the Central Valley sickened a lot of horses. More than 6,000 horses and mules literally died in this valley, including right here in, in our area. In 1931, professor from UC San Francisco Hooper Foundation, Carl Myers, and I uh, uh, then experimented station, a UC experimental station, which became UC Davis, uh, uh, CM Herring. If you've been on uh, campus at UC Davis, is Herring Hall. That is the name of this gentleman or this professor. The two of them came, wanted to get a horse that was sick, not dead, but sick. And they couldn't get anybody to give up a horse for the, the experiment. They came right here, I think, in Merced County. And I've been looking for that street to know where. The gentleman would not give the horse, but the wife say, you know what, this horse is going to die anyway. Sir, on the side, if you can, I'll sell you that horse for how much? $50. And don't make sure my husband doesn't know. How will we get the horse? Say, leave the $50 under the shoe on, on the doorstep as I 
as you, but you can come, the horse will be in such and such, take the head, they wanted to get the head, take the head and go. And actually that's what they did. They came, got the, uh, left the money, got the head of the horse that was sick, dying, and went back. The following day, the, the brain of the horse was in a culture and cultured. It's from that that they discovered the disease we know today as Western equine encephalomyelitis that we know today discovered 1931, and a few years before that, they'd found another disease called St. Louis encephalitis that had sickened people in Philadelphia just a few years before that. So that's 1931, and our association, California Mosquito Control Association, was started that previous year, 1930, and we're today 93 years old. Uh, 93 years old as an association. So in 1939, July 26, his side was born. The Board of Supervisors in the county decided they're going to create an, uh, a, a special district and they passed that law in and appointed staff, essentially appointed uh, trustees, six of them, which today we still have six trustees that serve at the, uh, on the board. And in November, they hired their first manager, Chester Robinson, to actually be the first man as a pretendent, which is the same as actually manager today. And the board of supervisors supported the district with money and a few farmers who were in um, essentially uh, um, concerned more, farmers and ranchers in, in the county uh, were involved in supporting that district to grow. Uh, we cover from us from then Tualame River North, and a new district, another district formed a few years later, Tulok Mosquito Bayman District formed below on the south side of that. They went under the law, Mosquito Bayman law. His side was formed under pest abatement law. Two different laws, one by one. We are the biggest in that law. Actually, we're the biggest district in that law, the rest of the state are in the mosquito abatement law. And there's, um, what would I say, funding structure that is fairly different between the two of us, us and Tulloch. We can not do benefit assessment today, they can. And so that structure constrains us in a little bit, but I just wanted to emphasize that in why we have two districts in the same county, right? Some of the folks, who uh, really were instrumental in growing the district for example here. In 1956, we moved from where we were, downtown Yosemite, to where we cut in the station, just east of the Modesto railway station, uh, Amtrak station. And but be before that, we had a runway actually built by MEPS, Ed MEPS, on MEPS Ranch and Faith Ranch. And here is a construction of that in 1959. And our pilots then, uh, Porter and our manager, second manager, uh, Gordon Smith uh, on, uh, on in that border there. So what does the law provide? And essentially this to help you uh, know how we operate and how we do our work. The districts both pay abatement and Mosquito Abatement under Chapter 1 of Health and Safety Code, Mosquito Abatement District under uh, Division 3, Pest Abatement under Division 8. The laws intertwine to actually make us function as the well. The district draws its authority to conduct its operation from these laws. Districts are special they, under Division 3 can levy special benefit assessment under Division 8 our laws are still hanging. We cannot just do that. So we depend on ad valorem. This is important because in 1978, when ad valorem was changed through Prop, Prop 13, Eastside had 25 full-time employees. We dropped from 25 to three because all our revenues disappeared. Um, um, uh, Tulloch was able to go out two years later and pass a benefit assessment and recover their uh, essential revenues as such. The purpose of districts, essentially in four parts, we are trying to conduct surveillance and, uh, and do appropriate studies to understand vectors, which mosquitoes are uh, part of the vector system. 
take action to prevent occurrence of vectors, take action to control or abate vectors, and take any action necessary for the powers granted by this law. And I've highlighted three uh, things there, conduct, prevent, and action to control or abate. What does that mean? Here, uh, the meaning. In under the law, abate means put an end to or reduce the intensity of a public nuisance. So mosquitoes, under the law, public nuisance, not necessarily disease, control, prevent, or reduce vectors. And the last part is public nuisance. This is where it's most important. And we, if you follow the strict part of the law, we won't do our work very well. But public nuisance is any property artificially altered from natural condition that supports the development or attraction or harborage of vectors, mosquitoes included, underlying artificially altered. Any water that is breeding place for vectors, any activity that supports the development, attraction, or harborage of vectors, or that facilitates the introduction of spread vectors. So anywhere in the jurisdiction where water stands, if it's natural environment where water stands, the district has all the responsibility to do everything they need to do to control those mosquitoes. Now, where water stands, that is a natural, being altered in any way, so essentially artificially altered, uh, pasture, uh, a ranch around your home in a swimming pool, that is altered. The responsibility shifts from the district to actually the property owner. Any property owner who therefore has water standing on their property takes responsibility of controlling mosquitoes that comes off that. The district should educate, teach, show, essentially hold a hand until they can be able to control that. Meanwhile, by the ultimate end, they're responsible for mosquitoes that comes off that. That's the law. Now, where districts deal with disease, that's a very different situation because disease can be quite amorphous. They're responsible to cover that. Many districts don't deal with the nuisance. Mosquitoes that come out of a district here, many of them are actually nuisance. They bite they're relentlessly. And that is what we try to manage and help folks to reduce the biting intensity, the nuisance. But disease is very different. And I'll go through to show you what I mean by that. Any questions? That's a history a little bit. And the law that actually guides us on how we do our work. Mosquitoes are not boring. When they bite, you can't go to sleep. You can't do anything. You can't barbecue. So what are these buggers that really ruin our environment? And I have at least so many mosquitoes here in the Central Valley. In the state, we have more than 39 species of mosquitoes. But there are some are more important than others, like animal farm as far as we're concerned, because of what they feed on. But I have only three main class of mosquitoes that really are menace to us, Anopheles, Culex, and Aedes. And from here today, when spring comes around, you'll be able to have an idea what is biting you. Look carefully, you'll be able to tell. Anopheles species, they mainly transmit malaria, and we mentioned that. If malaria got here, somebody got here sick in, 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 in transmission stage, and these you know, mosquitoes beat on them, they will acquire the disease and they will most likely can transmit it. So we have mosquitoes here, but no malaria. Culex species, the main one that really are menace is Culex tessalis and pipins. And I'll give highlights a little bit uh, later. They transmit Western equine encephalomyelitis, St. Louis encephalitis, and West Nile virus. We have another one called California encephalitis, which is rare. But those three are the main diseases we deal with here. We get these diseases all the time. And then the 80 species and three groups. This one is important. I'll break them as pasture mosquitoes. We have 80 melanoman, nigromaculus, and vexans. Most of our pastures here along the river runs are there. The nuisance we deal with if you're outside town, that's it. Most likely when the call comes June, July, where are we on, on the outskirts? And most likely those are the mosquitoes. 
And when they buy, they don't relent. Until I got here, I will have dismissed anybody who argued about that. But they're here and they're menaced and they don't stop. When they come to you, they do, you can swat them, but they will not leave. They'll just and come right back to you. They're very, very aggressive. The other mosquitoes I'm used to, and those ones we can deal with, the tree hole mosquitoes, Aedes sirensis, they transmit dog hardworm. Oh, the other one, passive mosquitoes, really don't transmit disease much. They're nuisance. If we know it, we'll just ignore them, or we don't. Uh, but they transmit, they don't transmit anything, nuisance. Tree hole mosquitoes, we go to Nice Ferry along the way, they are actually common in early spring and April, May, they'll be the one mainly biting. They live in tree holes and then they emerge as the spring thaws out. Uh, they transmit dog heartworm. Then invasive mosquitoes, those are new ones. In Stanislaus, now three years, we have Aedes aegypti. The other two, Notoscriptus and Albopictus on the way. In Los Angeles, we have all the three. And I was working there only a few years ago. If they were here, and this is good here. Denki, chikungunya, and Zika are what they'll transmit. And if you've heard before of yellow fever, is one of them. All these three diseases have occurred in the United States, at least imported. The first one, Denki, is already here, being transmitted in the in the country. Anopheles mosquito is a little more detail. Anopheles freebonai, Francis Canos, Panctipenis. There were vectors of malaria. 1952 was a major outbreak. Quite a bunch of people got sick in Auburn. Lake Vera was the area. And we have, over the years, imported cases in the Central Valley here. Returning folks from abroad, uh, uh, World War, uh, another World War. was the North Korea War? That was actually an outbreak from 52. And folks returning from the tropics tend to bring them back. And we have a few cases here and there. They feed mainly on mammals. Mammalian host, Anopheles. Their habitats, clean flowing water, vegetation, shaded vegetation, most riverbanks, canal, or rice fields. That's where you find them. Culex, the main one I mentioned, Pipians and Tassales. They're common here. Uh, Stigmatosoma erythrothorax are rare in dairy uh, out there. They transmit them. This is mentioned, Western Nequan, uh, St. Louis, and West Nile virus. They mostly feed on avian host unlike the Anopheles. The habitats vary. Some require clean flowing water, others require stagnant, uh, high organic matter water, vegetation, um, some in daily lagoons. But these are the main ones that I need to, significance of it, Pipians and Tassales. If you're in an urban area and you get beat when you're outside your house, they're not the past the mosquitoes, mostly they're this one. The pipians. Pipians is a main and urban mosquito. They breed in storm drains. They breed in bad swimming pool. They breed any standing water that is around your yard. Stands for three, four days. That will produce pipians. And um, they are very good vectors. West now, West, uh, Western Equan and St. Louis and Sophilides in urban areas. When we have outbreak of the West now, these are the mosquitoes that are transmitting from north to south of the state. And when we are working very hard to control mosquitoes for disease, this is it. Tassalis is mainly a rural mosquito. Uh, it breeds in fairly clean water flowing, irrigated pastures, rice fields along channels and canals. That's where it is. If the disease is actually widespread outside the city, this mosquito will be responsible for it. So they complement each other. In the rural areas where we have lots of birds, pastorines and all, in the, they spread up. Kid in the city, like uh, what I found out, Modesto has a lot of trees. Actually, it's one of the, the, uh, the, the city with lots of trees. So we have crows. And West Nile virus will literally, um, in the city, small pastorine birds move it to COVID. They, 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 they call uh, crows and magpies and, uh, and uh, ravens. Literally 95% of them die. But when they, before they do, they have lots of virus in them and they can transmit to small birds very easily. Culex does that in the city. Uh, I mean, Culex pipiens and Thessalus does that in the countryside. So we can have an outbreak of disease, literally spreading from the city to the 
countryside because of those two mosquitoes and the main ones that transmit most of the diseases we deal with now. Aedes mosquito I mentioned earlier, they are split in three. The pasture mosquitoes, those I'll not dwell on them again as much because they're what they are. They don't transmit disease, but a nuisance. The only part the feature with Aedes mosquitoes is they lay their eggs on moist soil, on water. But if they do lay eggs on water, it's actually on the meniscus, not directly on water. The other mosquito species do lay their eggs on water. This one on moist soil or any surface that is uh, 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 that water hits. The water can, I mean, the ground can dry to literally dust. Those eggs will still remain alive. And when the water hits it, they emerge and off they go. That's why you have um, um, pasture mosquitoes getting off in a hurry. We dry, pasture dry, water comes on, they pop off. And the tree hole mosquitoes behave the same. They stay in, uh, the eggs are laid in tree holes. They stay through summer, no problem. Come the next rain season, they hatch. And then the exotic mosquitoes that we deal with, that I'll talk about, uh, about later, they are the pain. They are master of the environment around homes as such. And just the details, a little bit of our mosquitoes here, the pasture mosquitoes feed on any holes that are valuable. They just menace as much as they can. Sierrensis, tree hole, dog, hardworm, and then the others, I'll talk about it towards the end, essentially. Right? A history and what mosquitoes we deal with up and down in the valley and around here. If you're in town, you're dealing with Culex, mostly. Now you have another new entrance, exotic Egypti is in town. Uh, you go to the outside, you're dealing with nuisance mosquitoes, and then the disease cutting one, which is Tessalis, Culex Tessalis. The pasture mosquitoes are black in, in color, heavier, and they don't give up. When they come to you, you swat, they come. You swat, they'll come. They're everywhere. Culex will come in and leave, but they more only bite at night. That's the beauty of it. Culex pipins and Culex tassales only bite at night. During the day, you call them, what time are you being beaten now? Right now, maybe no, most likely it's not Culex. The pasture mosquito will bite you in the day. Now, if you, you're being beaten in the day, and say, what does the mosquito look like? It's black and white. It's a new mosquito we have in town. You get the difference? It's actually very central like that. When you have a call for vector control, they ask you, when are you being beaten? We're trying to figure out the mosquitoes you're dealing with. And when we assess that, when the technician shows up, they know exactly what to look for. I do, am I looking in the drains? Am I looking in the swim in pools? Or should I look in the containers around the houses? And sometimes you can be beaten inside the houses. Which mosquito bites in the house? Very few. Egypta will actually live inside the house and hangi dory without any problem and will bite you relentlessly because they'll breed in flower pots and stuff. All right? Now, the most important part of what we do is surveillance. Surveillance is a very important portion of our work. What helps us to tell is what mosquitoes we're we dealing with over here, over there, over there. And we have proactive surveillance. We go look on a regular basis, and then there's reactive surveillance. And I, one, the proactive surveillance is where technicians are out every day. They leave the shop, they go out in their, in their zone to looking for mosquitoes and then to find what it is is going on. They walk around with dippers, they walk around doing stuff. That's proactive. But we go out trap for mosquitoes to see what is going on. The numbers are going up or what species. We do that on a regular basis. Then there's reactive. Where residents, they've been beaten out, they say, damn, I can't stand this anymore. And call in, please come. Uh, a day later, they say, you didn't show up. They're eating us alive. And we respond to that. That's really reactive. We don't want to do a whole lot of that. Wait until people are calling relentlessly but depends on the, the staff we have and the work we have. It's inevitable we 
also use that information very carefully for reactive, uh, for what we do on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, I go to the district of uh, two, three, three years ago. Uh, we worked literally in pen and pen, uh, pen and paper. Remember 1978, crop 13 came through and wiped our budget from, and I don't have pictures, I should have. We had 25 full-time employees of the district. We went to three as a manager, a clerk, and a mechanic. And then all our staff that to, do really the heavy lifting, our technician, turned into, we've turned into seasonal staff. Right now we have five full-time uh, technicians and the rest is still seasonal. It's a painful way to run a program. We need staff that know their job and that they're available to work most of the year, but that's what it is. We did everything on pen and paper. Uh, three years ago, we acquired a software that helps our staff to go out and manage now the, the work they do on a regular basis better. We have 10 zones as shown in the picture. And then we have 14 areas that are cab riggers that drive these jeeps. If you've seen them around town, two guys drive and they drive on the right hand drive and they're driving. They go with a, with a, with a wand, spraying material into the cabs and then uh, also gathers to reduce mosquitoes that actually breed underground with us. We normally in surveillance program, we set up traps to collect adult mosquitoes uh, based on CO2 that we use and gravity traps and then biogen traps. I'll show them a little bit later. We collect these mosquitoes, bring them back to the lab, identify them to species. Those species I mentioned earlier, so we can help the staff that are going out to treat to determine what they need to do. But in addition, we take these mosquitoes, uh, essentially identify the species, sex them, and then blood fed status, empty or um, no blood or blood fed or mixed. And then we pull them to our, a max of 50 females in a border. I didn't mention these. Mosquitoes only females take blood male or bite. The males don't. There's a reason for that. All, both male and females, take sugar, bad sugar for their energy, for survival. The females take blood males, their horns to do that because they need proteins for egg development. Once that is done, they, they're done. They actually go back for another meal. Um, every three, four days, they develop these spider bakes, lay them, then go back again. And they live for quite a while. Mosquitoes, depending on the species, some of them live for, what will I say? The shortest, we'll say two weeks. <laughs> the males, for sure, they're gone in two weeks, but the females live for a long time. Two, three weeks, we measure them, about 7% die every day. So at the end of two weeks, there are quite a few still around. And remember, disease requires incubation period, which is about seven to 12 days. For mosquito to transmit disease, it's a, it's a, it has lived at least 12 days to 14 days. We have mosquitoes that live for six months, alive, adults. The mosquitoes that will bite you this spring, and God forbid, I don't say they should bite you, try to avoid them. Mosquitoes, adults, will be coming out as it warms up. They were adults in October. They didn't lay eggs. They took blood meal and created fat. And they've been hanging around during winter with just consuming fat through winter. They emerge in spring. Those are culex. They emerge in spring to take the first meal, lay eggs, and then they die. So they can live for quite a while. The 80s died off. They laid the eggs and they're gone. The 80s, I mentioned, uh, they're gone. So it's uh, eggs and larvae that will develop to the new cohort next year. Egypti does the same. All the 80s, Anopheles, we, we'll, uh, Anopheles and, and, and uh, Culex, they hang around, the females only, to the next season. So they live for a long time, depending on species. Anyway, we pull... It is Egypta for pesticide resistant because of the material we use. And then we also collect dead birds through the state hotline and test them for disease. So once in a while, if there's a disease around, we get um, 
the county public health agency epidemiology they share with us if there's somebody who has a virus somewhere they identify in the hospital or clinics they for that information we can follow up and know what is the extent of disease sometimes this zika chikungunya or dengue or any other exotic disease transmitted by mosquitoes they let us know so we actually work with them to know what extent of disease is and here are the trap or the surveillance methods we use the gentleman here or staff with the standard dipper and that's actually a very important tool for surveillance we go essentially any parts any water standing we go deep to look how many mosquitoes larvae are in there what stage first second third or fourth or pupae we count that and use that as surveillance if you have a hundred you know you have a probe if you one or two that's okay the threshold is about one or two if you have uh, many then you have a problem sometimes you don't get any as you did which is a, is a good thing the next one these are traps for adults on the bottom uh, right is a gravity trap it uses water that mimics the high ridge organic water that occurs out there attracts mostly culex pipient this one here we have uh, we brew the water and put in those containers and that is just a toolbox it sucks mosquitoes in when we turn in at night and we go in the morning we pick up the number of mosquitoes in there can tell us what is going on in the neighborhood the species and all the other two the top are um, uh, left is virgin trap and now one uses lure the smell of our skin and it has an attraction that we put in there it attracts mosquitoes based on what actually the smell is and we set them up we can add co2 and it'll double up on that and right at the bottom here is a co2 beta trap we have a canister of dry co2 at the top as it releases uh, co2 sublimes the co2 settles down mosquitoes will come close to that bag below and they are actually sucked into the trap that runs at night and then we pick them up up in the morning all the three pick them in the morning identify the species sex and tell what really need to do in that area and then the other pools for testing of disease that comes along yes yes do you still maintain any exposed hens i know they use for actually no we don't and all other districts some districts still do i think my said do but most districts have actually left uh, uh left the chickens uh, we kept the chickens across the state uh, as a sentinel flock. We put them out there, mosquitoes in the neighborhood. If they feed them, the eggs get a Western equine or St. Louis, and the antibodies are picked through it. We, do, we bled them every two weeks, and that antibodies can tell us what disease is circulating around the area. And most districts actually slowed down and moved away because of the new disease uh west nile virus it came through it was so ubiquitous that when infected uh chickens they were all test positive and when they do you have to get new chickens otherwise we'll be feeding the rest of the chickens for the year without any utility so many districts moved away because that disease became so ubiquitous everywhere and we don't have chickens anymore but i really like the eggs because yeah. <laughs> that we <laughs> we we consume the eggs and at the end of the season, who wants a chicken? Really, not just a regular chicken, but a hen to take home. And so uh, folks still ask for that, but we don't uh, keep them anymore across the state. Only a few districts still have that, most of the big ones. Um, oh, well, we operation. Actually, this is where really most of our work is done across the state, but our, our district also do is operation where we have the district interacting with the with the residents and also having impact on the on the mosquito numbers and the disease is operation every district that does run a good mosquito pro program has to have a good operational program and east side when we got decimated what they ensured to have was to make sure we have technicians that can run essential operational work they turn them into seasonal come April 1 to October 31st to run the operation. And I'm so glad we maintain that because we have staff who worked for a long time 
It's fine by time, but they are good at what they do. They know what mosquitoes we have here and how to take care of them. But when they do get a service request, the calls, they know where to go and what to do. But also when they are not doing that, they're going on a routine, just inspecting properties where it is. We had previous uh, breeding going on and then they know what to do. But when they arrive on a property, they do inspection to determine the source of mosquitoes there and the type of species that we're dealing with. And normally, whatever we do to control, to the material we use to control mosquitoes, you have to make sure you know the species and you know what type and the quantity of mosquitoes are dealing there before you put any material out there. And I'll go through these a little bit. So the technician must decide what method, if there are mosquitoes there, what method they're going to use to control it and also advise residents what they can do to help solve the problem. So they, the source goes away. And remember that if you have a property artificially altered, the problem is actually the issue of the resident, not us, not the uh, district. But the district has obligation to educate and show. So as we finish and do, we educate. We show what needs to be done, work with us until the mosquitoes are actually gone. But we're going to the source. Remember, the neighbors who are being bitten have no control over the source. We have to focus on the source who are producing uh, mosquitoes. We can apply different material, herbicide, pupicide, and adult side to control those. And we'll do that. Then come back, set reinspection, retreatment along the way. What do we deal with when we go to properties? You won't believe. I know many of us keep our properties nice and all, but others really indifferent. Those are the ones that cause a lot of problems. We find this uh, on properties and the new mosquitoes that we have really love this. Uh, they love such an environment. Regular development that the city does, the drain, the sumps and all that, they actually mosquito issues. The northeast of Modesto, we have a lot of uh, sumps and electrovolts that are mosquito galore as such. Some of the mosquitoes, like they could live in small areas like that. So don't ignore anything that holds water for two to three days is actually a source for mosquitoes. The methods of controlling mosquitoes, and I don't know what time now, I, I did not look at my clock. Uh, 10 more minutes, 10 more minutes. There you go. So these are the many ways we uh, control mosquito cultural methods, behavioral control, chemical, innovative technologies for mosquitoes. We use them all. The last one I will emphasize in a bit. We have many, many products we use to control mosquitoes and chemical ones. The three, the top three are no longer uh, in our industry. We don't use them anymore. Biopesticides, juvenile hormone, ecdyson is what we use. And then the microbials, BTI or Bacillus thuringiensis, Firicus and spinosis. And then we have botanicals and analogs that we use. Really, most of this material are very environmentally friendly. We use oil, that's only an exigent a little bit, to control mosquitoes we can't control. So in emergency, pupae are here, we need to put on these and we'll get rid of them. The current mosquitoes I mentioned are environmentally friendly. And then what we've actually sustained on is a, essentially innovation. The material we have, the chemists we have, most of the things we use today are focused on different types of mosquitoes. We have single broods or multiple broods. That when we put them out, they're different familiar. We put them out, we control mosquitoes for a long period of time, depending on the source we're dealing with. And those formulations help us in many ways to control mosquitoes. Our technicians responding to service squares have to make a choice of all this material they need to use to control mosquitoes as we go along. Spraying to kill adults is really the last resort. And I know homeowners say, no, you didn't spray. It doesn't warrant to spray because I found only two or three mosquitoes. But it, when we do, is the last resort. If the disease is high, we'll do. When we do, we use several uh, methods, handhelds or backpacks or track mounted sprayers and sometimes aerial. Some of the back, um, uh, backpack and uh, when the small containers are those are stills and then handheld colds for Aedes aegypti. We have backpack spreaders for dry material, hand cans for some oil, and then the rest of the equipment. 
Now, different of these spread, atomize the material into small particles, the sprayers, 15 to 50 microns, that's a fogging. We have misters, 60 to 180 microns, and then the, uh, the mist cannon for spray, spraying actually uh, on water directly some oil if there's a uh, material that needs to be used in that end. Some of the material, um, the equipment we're trying to perfect is like this one, ATV mounted, is actually new. We haven't taken it as much to the field, but it will help us in those pastures a lot. One of the technologies that have come through at our district essentially is this, is with a software that we have now integrates with our foggers and also integrates with the aerial planes. We have two planes that sprays um, uh, liquid uh, and dry. The liquid one also integrated. So when our staff shows up and sprays, uh, when they're done, the data they actually spray, the footprint they draw, we can see it on the computer at work. And also our planes, when they go out to spray, there's no drift. You cannot say, oh, you know what? I was two miles away and I got hit by the spray. We can see where the plane was because the footprint is left in our, tr uh, our software. And that, those are two planes, the yellow one, sprayed liquid larvicide and fogging at the other side. The red one sprays only, spreads only granules, dry product. Right? We have only a few minutes, but I want to walk you through the last bit. 80s, the invasive 80s. I was in Southern California in Los Angeles. We had a new mosquito there, Aedes alpopictus. And before I left, we'd gotten two more, Aedes aegypti and the Aedes notoscriptus. Notoscriptus comes from Australia. Aegypti is from Central South America and Eastern US. Alpopictus came actually from abroad, China. And we've gotten, they're all three in the state. And I picked up actually two of those uh, where they happened. We, where I worked, we are the one who picked up notoscriptors before it was picked up elsewhere. And of course, when I came to here, 2019, within a few months, we picked it up. It spread, they spread very quickly. This is uh, Invasive Aedes, and those are the location where I worked in San Gabriel Valley. And they spread quick when I get in place. It's very difficult to get rid of them, very difficult. And within just a few years, they spread double, triple, multiple times when they reach in a place. And when to control them, you have to put in essentially 10 times effort to manage to just locate where they are. We only have so many staff, 10, 12 technicians. We cannot get else everywhere. And that's the problem. And nobody has managed to control them. Just to show the example here, you have to put in many times effort to just be able to bear. These are positive location and negative location where we're working 100%. I had 15 people just focus on Egypt in San Gabriel. We couldn't make a dent. Those are the tools we use uh, for Aedes aegypti. And when they buy, the nuisance is just extreme. The disease is just imported, but the nuisance of Aedes aegypti is extreme. Why is it extreme? Is the breed in everything around you. The only mosquito that bites on human, it relies on humans only. The females want human blood, nothing else, not cows, not dogs, not human. That's why they're relentless and they live around people. How many bites are too much? I'm telling you, every bite is very important. One mosquito or two, will terrorize all of us here in an hour. I will all know there was a mosquito in this room. That's how bad that mosquito is. Here's a nuisance. I have at least here where I worked there is when it gets in a place the first year, it's tough. Everybody knows that it's there. The second season, it goes down. The third season is actually down. Not that the mosquitoes disappeared, but people have gotten used to this mosquito in place. The first year, very irritating, very, very uh, itchy. As you go on, people get used to it, and it calms down. I'm not saying you should get used to the mosquito. When you get it, call in, we'll follow through. What are we going to do? 
only so much. This is uh, index case. We got Mosquito here in Modesto. That's a container I showed you earlier. That's a container right there. And I told the residents, hey, sir, this container has mosquitoes. You cannot keep water outside like that. They say, what is the problem? It's just water for my birds. So look at it. Look at the edge of that bucket right above. There's a dark spot and say, look at this. Let me magnify it. Oh my goodness. That's where it lays the eggs. And once water hits it, it's everywhere. We got the first mosquito right here in Modesto, 2019, and it spread. We had the media in place and everybody knew about it. In Northern California, we're the north, northmost. Within two weeks, Sacramento, a Plaza, San Joaquin announced it because people called and they realized what was biting them. Now it's well north to Shasta. That's a neighborhood. I have this picture for a reason because this was an index case. We work with these. We could not get this mosquito out. If we control this area, we might have held Egypt from spreading further because that was the backyard. And we, as we speak, we've never been able to manage this. So with court enforcement and homeowner association, they have not gotten rid of it. Now, that was 2019. Lakewood Scenic Area is Modesto 2020. Mar Roselle, Dry Creek Mobile uh, Estate. 2021, we have in Village One. If you live or know anybody in Village One, 2021, calls were ringing off the hook, literally at the district. We could do anything we can. There were only a few, but there was nothing we could change. And we can't fly our planes over there. Our plane cannot fly over residential areas. They're small, single engine. And then the list of the impacts of where we found them are there. Uh, just this year, and I say, I don't give up, but we know oh, we have them. Waterford got it. We have in uh, Riverbank, Oakdale, uh, 2021, 2022 was Waterford. All our districts invested except, infested except Night Ferry, and that's it. And what I'll say, what we do for this coming year are three things, uh, or several things. We're going to continue proactively, reactive surveillance. Our technician will inspect, will trap, and know where they are. Application live and that will continue. Track mountain misting will continue. And essentially, the most important, community engagement, because it's a mosquito problem for all of us. You see something, tell somebody. The neighbors have to know. Really what bite us is around here. This mosquito only flies 250 feet from birth to death. 250 feet. Just know if you're being beaten by Egypti, it is your neighbor. Either you or your neighbor, nowhere else. It doesn't fly from far, it's right around you. If you get rid of containers, you get rid of it. Community engagement will help us. Sanitation, removing all the stuff that are exposed to sprinklers or rain will actually do it. Right? Any questions? Yes. <laughs> Aside from the nuisance value of our computer, there are also vectors of parasites and viruses and all sorts of nasty stuff. And 